next on Unsolved Mysteries. The notorious Son of Sam case. Six brutal murders by one serial killer. But a reporter has convincing evidence that David Berkowitz did not act alone. He was a young man in love, just trying to be nice. Now he's dead. She survived the train crash that killed her mother. Now she desperately wants to find her mother's family. And a mysterious carpenter builds a magical staircase for a chapel in New Mexico. Then he disappears. These are five fascinating cases just waiting to be solved. And maybe you hold the key. I'm Dennis Farina, and this is Unsolved Mysteries. In 1977, the country breathed a huge sigh of relief when police finally captured the serial killer called the Son of Sam. David Berkowitz confessed to killing six people in New York City and injuring seven others. But now reporter Maury Terry has convincing evidence that there may have been others involved. Son of Sam's reign of terror began on July 29th, 1976. Two young girls were hit by 44 caliber bullets. One died. This composite sketch of the gunman was created from the survivor's eyewitness description. Three months later, a man from Queens was shot in the head with a 44 caliber gun. A month after that, again in Queens, a man appeared from nowhere and shot two girls. Both survived, but one was left paralyzed and would be in a wheelchair for the rest of her life. Eyewitnesses helped police create a new composite of the gunman. Six months later, two other women were killed in separate shootings. Again, a 44 caliber revolver was used. Eyewitnesses created these sketches of the killer. But these sketches didn't look anything like the earlier drawings. Almost nine months after the first murder, there was another shooting just three blocks from the scene of the first attack. This time, a hand-printed letter was left by the killer. It read, I am a monster. I am the son of Sam. I'm a little brat. The city was paralyzed with fear. The people in the local neighborhoods, particularly in the Bronx, were petrified. Um, I remember people yelling to people in the street, get in, that nuts out there. And this is an, an Early afternoon. On Memorial Day, Son of Sam sent another letter. This one to columnist Jimmy Breslin. It was written in the same distinctive style and contained references to Satanism. Finally, in late July, Son of Sam struck for the last time. Stacy Moskowitz was killed. Her date, Robert Violante, was partially blinded. No, he just, he just walked up to them, shot them in the head. Nineteen-year-old Tommy Zeno witnessed the shooting. That guy came over to, to the car and blew those people away in less than four seconds, like. Tommy helped police with yet another composite. Again, there were more differences than similarities when compared to the earlier sketches. As the police were investigating the most recent murder, they found that a car near the crime scene 
had been issued a parking ticket. The Ford Galaxy was owned by a postal worker named David Berkowitz. The police traced the ticket to Berkowitz's home. As they approached his building, they saw the Ford Galaxy. Inside, they found a duffel bag with a rifle sticking out of it and a letter signed by the son of Sam. Hey John, look at this. We got him. The police staked out the area. Later that evening, Berkowitz walked towards his car carrying a brown paper bag. Inside the bag was a 44 caliber revolver. As detectives moved in to arrest him, Berkowitz sat quietly in his car. What took you guys so long? Step out of the car. David Berkowitz confessed to all the killings. He told the police that his neighbor's barking dog told him to commit the murders. He pleaded guilty to all the charges and was sentenced to 25 years to life. But to reporter Maury Terry, Berkowitz's confession seemed too convenient. After the arrest of Berkowitz, uh, just through fate or whatever, I started poking around into the case uh, because I had some suspicions that uh, maybe there was more to it than the public was being, uh, being led to believe. Maury suspected that Berkowitz didn't act alone, but that he was part of a gang of killers. It was Stacy Moskowitz's killing that first made him suspicious. Well, the very early reports that um, on the Moskowitz killing had me concerned. David Berkowitz's features were widely different from the sketches of the killer that had been done by the police artist. Started seeking out witnesses, found Tommy Zeno, who was a key witness in the to the shooting. Tommy and his girlfriend were parked in front of Stacy Moskowitz and her boyfriend on the night of the murder. I was looking through the mirror of the car, and I see I noticed somebody, you know, standing in the park. What I seen is he had long hair, and it's hard to really see the face, but it was he was thin. He looked like he was in pretty good shape. He walked up to the car like as if he was going to get in the car, and then he went into a stance and he just shot. And that was it. He turned around and ran. I can't picture Berkowitz running like that. That's the thing that confused me after they caught him. If they seen him, it's either he was, he, you know, in a week he can't get that fat, you know? And he, that's all I could say. He's, he's, you know, he didn't look like the type of guy to run and do that. This map shows the neighborhood where the last killing took place. Stacy and her boyfriend were parked here. The Ford Galaxy owned by Berkowitz was parked here, two blocks away when it got the parking ticket. Maury Terry says the events leading up to the shooting began here, at this entrance to the park. It was about 1 a.m. Witnesses saw a yellow Volkswagen pull up. Two men got out. By 1.30 a.m., Tommy Zano was sitting in his car. He noticed the yellow VW pass by more than once. At 2.05 a.m., the parking ticket was put on Berkowitz's car. Cecilia Davis, a woman who lived in the neighborhood, pulled up in a friend's car near the Ford Galaxy. We were triple packed, and I was looking in the in the back, so in case a car comes up, I saw that guy taking the summons off his windshield and keep on looking, watching the cops as they still gave tickets. Then he got in the car and he came behind us. So he couldn't pass because we were blocking the whole street. And he blowed the horn at us. I gave him a dirty look. What's the big rush in the middle of the night? Cecilia says the man was definitely David Berkowitz. 15 minutes after the parking ticket was issued, Stacy and Robert went for a stroll in the park. They noticed a man standing next to a restroom watching them. Two blocks away, Cecilia was walking her dog by her apartment. She saw David Berkowitz, 
the man who had honked earlier, walking straight towards her. Cecilia says that about one minute later, she heard the gunshots that killed Stacy Moskowitz and almost blinded Robert Violante. How could Berkowitz have traveled from this spot where Cecilia last saw him to this area where Stacy and Robert were shot in just one minute? It takes at least two and a half minutes to quickly walk the two blocks from Bay 17th Street to the park. Just 15 seconds after the shooting, witnesses saw a man wearing a light-colored wig run from the park, get into a yellow Volkswagen, and speed away up 17th Avenue. He was in such a hurry that he ran a red light and almost hit another car. Maury Terry believes that at least three people, including Berkowitz, were involved in Stacy's murder. He claims they were members of a satanic cult and were responsible for every one of the Son of Sam shootings. David Berkowitz was selected to be the fall guy on the Son of Sam killings. Um, he was not a willing fall guy. He wanted it to be another way. But Berkowitz knew that he had been involved in all of the shootings. Uh, he had uh, pulled the trigger definitely two times, responsible for three murders. He's not an innocent man, and was on the scene of all the others as a lookout, a wheelman, whatever. No, I didn't think it was David Berkowitz then, and I don't think it's him now. It's a strong opinion of mine that David Berkowitz was not the sole killer and was aided by other accomplices. Next. David Berkowitz's connection to a satanic cult. Is it possible that he did not act alone? When David Berkowitz confessed to the Son of Sam murders, it was believed that he had acted alone. But a very disturbing theory soon emerged that Berkowitz was a member of a satanic cult, and it was this group that committed the murders. The general perception among the public for years had been that David Berkowitz was a lone gunman. The facts and the evidence, not speculation, the facts and the evidence say otherwise. Maury says that cryptic references in one of the Son of Sam letters supports his theory. One phrase that raised his suspicions was, quote, John Wheaties, rapist and suffocator of young girls. Another was Wicked King Wicker. Maury views them as clues that help identify an accomplice of David Berkowitz, the son of Sam. Berkowitz lived in a seventh floor apartment in Yonkers. Down the hill was a street named Wicker. Could this be King Wicker mentioned in the Breslin letter? Wicker Street was near the home of another character mentioned in the letter, John Wheaties. I learned that the John Wheaties rapist and suffocator, alias of the killer in the Breslin letter, was not really an alias at all, but it was the name of a real person. That person was John Carr, who was the real life son of Sam Carr. John Carr's nickname was Wheaties, and I learned this within a day of the arrest. This is John Carr, and these are two composite drawings of the 44 caliber killers. Maury Terry believes that there is a resemblance between these two and John Carr. Maury tracked down John Carr to North Dakota, where he worked as a mechanic at a local Air Force base. This is where he lived during the mid-70s, but he often visited New York during the time of the Son of Sam attacks. Well, from my experience, John Carr was a mixed-up drug addict many, many months before Berkowitz was ever arrested. He had talked about his friend Berkey to his friends out in Minot, North Dakota. John Carr was a friend of, a confidant of, and an associate of David Berkowitz. Just six months after Berkowitz was arrested, John Carr was found dead in his girlfriend's apartment. When I first walked in the room, it was a ghastly sight. My first interview with his live-in girlfriend at the time, she told me that he must have just taken his own life. The next day, same person, new interview, whole new story. John Carr had to have been murdered. He was wanted by the police 
in New York for the Son of Sam killings. He was afraid for his life, and I fully believe that John Carr was murdered. Through interviews with uh, Carr's friends and the police officials in North Dakota, uh, the picture emerged of John Carr being heavily involved in satanic cult activity, both in Minot, North Dakota, and in Westchester County, New York, where he spent part of his time. Uh, it involved blood drinking, urine drinking, the ritualistic sacrifice of animals, specifically German shepherds. The satanic symbol that was found on the letters sent to Breslin was also found written on Carr's phone book. One of Carr's acquaintances was a man named Phil Falcon. Falcon claimed he accidentally walked in on Carr and a friend performing a satanic ritual. Phil Falcon told us that he walked into his own house one night in North Dakota and found John Carr and another friend of Carr as part of the circle. In the act of ritualistically sacrificing an animal right in Falcon's uh, house. It's all right, we're out of here. What are you guys doing? And Phil Falcon also told us that John Carr belonged to a very, very violent satanic cult in Westchester County. Prison sources who knew Berkowitz told Maury Terry that Berkowitz had been introduced to the cult by John Carr's brother, Michael, in the 70s. Michael Carr ended up inviting Berkowitz to attend what he called a floating coven party. And uh, Berkowitz came in and attended the party and symbolically, not literally, but symbolically, the 44 was put into his hand that night. That's how he got in to the, into the cult scene. Over two years after Berkowitz was arrested, Michael Carr was killed in a car accident on a New York highway. He died just 18 months after his brother. How many members of this devilish cult? Berkowitz admitted during two different court depositions that he knew both John and Michael Carr and that they were part of a satanic cult. And he said, the brothers were killed to keep them from talking. Yes. Maury Terry believes the deaths of the Carr brothers may have been organized by the, quote, 22 disciples of hell that were mentioned in the Breslin letter. He also says this satanic group performed their rituals in a local park just one mile from Berkowitz's apartment. I got a call from a young boy in Yonkers who wanted to know if I knew that there was a satanic cult that was meeting uh, in Untermeyer Park in Yonkers and killing dogs. And so I met him down there, showed me where the cult was meeting. We saw all the satanic graffiti, saw the remains of probably uh, two or three German shepherds. It was a very significant development in the case. Was a satanic group responsible for the Son of Sam attacks? Berkowitz himself seems to support the theory. He ended one of his letters to the media by stating, there are other sons out there. God help the world. If you have any information about this case, please log on to our website at unsolved.com. Next, a beautiful young con artist goes on a crazy spending spree. The problem is, it's not her money. Las Vegas, Nevada. Liza Montgomery shopped all weekend, always paying with cashier's checks. She made a big impression and started to raise big suspicions. It began at the home of a man named Mark Hughesby, who was selling a mink coat and a two-carat diamond ring. Montgomery, who was dressed to the nines, said that she was responding to his newspaper ad. Hi, Liza. How are you? Come on in. Oh, thank you. Liza's personality was like that of an excited schoolgirl. Here is your cashier's check. My God, there it is. And there's the ring. Liza, oh, I told you to bring cash. Gosh. I know, but the bank was closing and uh, Anyway, that's just as good. I mean, don't worry about it. And it's a good check. Well, oh, can I see your ID, please? Oh, sure. Uh, I asked to see her identification because I had told her when she came to the home here. Oh, anyway, 
that I did want cash, but uh, I settled for the cashier's check. Well, let me walk you to the car. Oh, all right. Thank you. As I was saying goodbye to, to, to Liza, uh, and I walked her out to her car, uh, it seemed very unusual to me that she, how she treated the mink coat. She just uh, literally shoved it in the car as if it meant nothing to her. Montgomery's shopping marathon was just beginning. That same night, she bought two rings with a cashier's check for $39,000. Here's your cashier's check. And here are your rings. Liza had been coming to us for about three months. She was always well-dressed, so we never had a problem believing whether or not she could actually afford anything she wanted to. Here's your cashier's check. Oh, great. The next day, Montgomery continued her shopping spree. She was wearing her new mink coat, and she was driving an old, beat-up moving van. She bought $23,000 worth of furniture that she called a surprise gift for her husband. Montgomery shopped all weekend, always paying with cashier's checks. She made a big impression and started to raise suspicions. Shortly after selling Montgomery the mink coat and the ring, Mark Usby began to wonder whether her check was good. He drove to an exclusive gated community looking for the address printed on her ID. Hi. Do you have Eliza Montgomery living here at 2901 Rancho Bel Air Drive? No, sir. That address doesn't even exist. Mark drove home immediately and called the police. I explained to him that unless or until the bank received that check, and officially notified him that it was counterfeit or somehow forged, there was really nothing we could do at that point. Even if we were able to find her, we'd have no authority to detain her simply because the address on a cashier's check was somehow an error. Be careful with that. Meanwhile, at the furniture store, Montgomery was having trouble squeezing everything she bought into the van. I don't care what you have to do. Just get it in there. Just, just get it in. OK. The store owner didn't like Montgomery's attitude. So once the van was loaded, he decided to follow, just to see where she would go. Before leaving, he gave his wife a walkie-talkie, and he took one for himself. She's turning away from Rancho Bel Air. I knew she was lying. Call the police. I'm going to keep following her. OK. We learned from dispatch that the check had already been passed at the furniture store and that it was in the name of Liza Montgomery which was the exact same name that Mark Usby had given us. Based on that information, we felt that there was enough corroboration now, since there were two checks floating around, that she needed to at least be stopped and identified. The store owner followed Montgomery's van to a residential neighborhood five miles away. She just pulled over onto a residential street and met up with a man standing next to a red convertible. Now, he's getting into the truck. She's getting into the car. OK. My husband says that the woman made contact... The store with owner's wife tried to keep authorities informed of her husband's location. ...the store owner to uh, try and keep up with the vehicle if he can, and uh, we'll be there uh, momentarily, within two or three minutes. He continued to follow the van and red convertible. When the vehicles got to an intersection outside of town, the van made an illegal right turn and sped away. She stopped her car. Well, I better get out of here. The store owner was afraid that Montgomery might be armed, so he took off. She chased after him. After three miles, he pulled over to the side of the road. Montgomery whizzed by and disappeared. The police were just minutes behind, but it was too late. In summary, she hit at least 12 places that we're aware of, and uh, the amount of loss to all of those in total was over $150,000. The last of the places she hit uh, was a gaming supply store, at which time she bought three slot machines, almost as if she wanted to take a souvenir of Las Vegas with her out of town. Eventually, the van and convertible were found. Montgomery had rented both vehicles at local agencies and persuaded the rental agent to accept a $500 cash deposit instead of a credit card. Usually, we only find this type of skill amongst people who are going to uh, get involved in a scam that's worth thousands upon thousands of dollars. If they're going to get away with it, they're going to have to be very good, and Liza was one of the best. But even the best make mistakes. 
When Montgomery rented the van, she left behind this ID card. And there was her picture for all to see. Update. Thanks to a viewer tip, authorities identified Liza Montgomery as Ellen Christine Huvera. They tracked her to Hollywood, California, where she was arrested. Ellen Huvera later pleaded guilty to burglary and theft charges. She served time in the Nevada State Penitentiary and has since been released. Coming up, love turns deadly when a young man gets involved with a killer. Chicago, Illinois. A fire blazes in a vacant lot at the edge of the city. Smoldering deep in the flames is the burnt body of 22-year-old Oscar Velasquez. At the county morgue, Oscar's parents are faced with the most difficult task of their lives, identifying the remains of their oldest son. I never thought we would find him there. He was a good kid. He never got into trouble. He didn't drink. He didn't smoke. He was different from the other kids in the neighborhood. Oscar had managed to avoid the local gangs and held a steady job as a truck driver. He had just started dating an attractive 18-year-old named Regina DeFrancisco. Mrs. DeFrancisco, would you have a seat, please? And your Two days after Oscar's body was found, Regina's mother and sister went to the police. They reported that Regina was missing. She's been gone for two days. So this is the first time? The same detectives that were investigating Oscar's murder visited Regina's house. While searching for clues, they discovered a key piece of evidence linking Regina to Oscar. Detective. Lo and behold, to our surprise, there was the matching pillowcases to the sheet that was used to wrap Oscar's body up in. And that's when our focus of our investigation switched to Regina herself. Hey, Oscar. Oh, hey. What up? How are you doing? Everyone agreed that Oscar's life took a bad turn when he met Regina. You look beautiful, too. Thank you. In the short period of time, approximately three weeks, they only had maybe three or four dates. And I think. Oscar was blinded by Regina's good looks. But behind those good looks lurked a dangerous woman. Regina apparently had another boyfriend, a gang member nicknamed Loco, and she needed $1,000 to bail him out of jail. Regina decided to get the money from Oscar, and she asked her sister Margaret for help. Detectives believe that Margaret told Oscar that it was Regina who was in jail and needed to be bailed out. Can you get us some money? I got $1,000. Is that enough? Oscar being the loyal and true boyfriend that he thought he was. I'll get it back to you, I promise. Didn't hesitate at all. Oscar gives Margaret the $1,000. Margaret tells Oscar as soon as she bails Regina out of jail, that Regina will call him. Regina did call Oscar, and the two went out on another date. Thank you so much, baby, for helping me. It's all right. <laughs> you know I love you. You do? I'll do anything for you. Apparently, Oscar asked Regina when she was going to pay him back, and that's when she came up with the idea to kill him. Baby, I don't have the money right now. I just got out of jail. Regina says, hey, you know, I'm sorry. I'm willing to pay you back, give you a little extra. Uh, Margaret really likes you too. You know, how about coming over and I'll give you your money and uh, the three of us will have a little fun. Are you serious? <laughs> and that's when uh, Regina offered the, the threesome, the sexual encounter. And Oscar was pretty willing to turn around and oblige. 
Witnesses say Oscar arrived at Regina's home at around 8 p.m. Margaret greeted him at the door. Hey. Hi. What is your hair? Um, I don't, I'm, I don't know. Regina's downstairs waiting for you. Oh. <laughs> A friend of the DeFrancisco sisters was also at the house. I'm down here, baby. I'm in the basement. Oscar went ahead of Margaret, walked down the steps, and when he made it to the last step in the basement, Margaret took the semi-automatic, <laughs> shot him one time in the back of the head. Come on, let's go. Investigators believe that the girls took Oscar's necklace, car keys, and $600 in cash. Okay. Next, they wrapped his body in a bed sheet and a tarp. The sisters then cleaned up the crime scene and dragged Oscar's body up the basement stairs and dumped it into the trunk of his car. Then they drive around, I'd say for approximately 40 minutes, looking for a spot to dump the body until they happened upon this vacant lot. Oh, okay, pour it on there. One of the girls take a large bottle of nail polish remover. They ignite the, the body. Get back. And drive away. Two days later, police discovered Oscar's Camaro near where his body was found. It also had been torched. The case broke wide open. Margaret and Regina's friend came forward and gave police a detailed account of what she witnessed on the night of Oscar's murder. Come on, let's go. Arrest warrants were issued for Regina and Margaret D. Francisco, but by now, both had disappeared. Update. Almost two years after Oscar's murder, authorities received a tip saying that Margaret was living with a relative in Illinois. She was arrested and charged with first-degree murder, armed robbery, and concealing a homicide. Seven months after her sister was arrested, Regina DeFrancisco was captured in Dallas and charged with murder. The police were called after Regina was accused of stealing a car from a friend. Both sisters were convicted of murder. Regina was sentenced to 35 years in prison, and Margaret 46 years. Next, a tragic accident claims the life of a young mother. Now her grown daughter wants to find her mother's family. Dallas, Texas. A train rumbles out of town, headed west. Two hundred miles down the line in Abilene, Darlene Alfano and a friend gather up their children for a trip into town. The train and the Alfano car reach Abilene at the same time. No one knows why, but the car suddenly stops on the tracks at the railroad crossing. The accident killed three of the children and one of the mothers. U.S. Army Sergeant Fred Alfano lost his wife and two of his daughters. His third child, LaDonna, suffered massive head injuries. What happened to mommy? Over the years, LaDonna underwent a number of operations that gradually restored her face. But of course, nothing could bring back her sisters or her mother, Darlene. I have no memories of my mother at all. I look at pictures of her and I try to remember something. It's like looking at a, a magazine article of a woman. My father has told me stories about us as children with my mom and 
It doesn't bring back any memories whatsoever. None whatsoever. This photo of LaDonna's aunt, Patricia Heinz, was her only hope for finding her mother's family. Update. As a result of our broadcast, LaDonna's search came to an emotional end. She found her aunt, Patricia. A few weeks later, LaDonna was pulling up to her Aunt Pat's house in Sioux Falls. Hello. Hi. Hello. Hi. LaDonna. Aunt Pat. Hi. Hi. Oh, oh it's been good. Oh, you're just quaking. <laughs> Don't cry. <laughs> I'm, I'm, thank you. So do you. It's totally changed my life. Do you believe it? Yeah, I believe it. Yeah. It's just finding them, them and they're great people, and <laughs> they're beautiful. I just, I'm, I just, I feel totally, my, that hole, the empty hole is totally filled. She lost her mother, I lost my sister. And it's just like, she found a, another mother and I found a new sister. And I just feel like, I just feel like we're just connected. I really do. I can't believe LaDonna's first visit with her grandparents in more than 30 years made the reunion complete. Thank you so much. From your mother. She made this? I can't even express it. I just really cannot express how I feel. There's just too many emotions going on here, and it's just a wonderful, wonderful feeling. It's just, it's great. I just feel like I'm, I just feel really like I'm at home. It's really great. More than a century ago, a mysterious carpenter arrived at a tiny chapel in Santa Fe, New Mexico. What he left behind became legendary. Was he just a talented craftsman or someone infinitely more special? Santa Fe, New Mexico. In 1852, this was the last outpost along the Santa Fe Trail a haven for outlaws, gamblers, mavericks, and renegades. The Sisters of Loretto, a religious order in Kentucky, sent seven nuns to bring religion and order to the town. This is an A. Once they arrived, the sisters' first job was to build a school and a chapel. They call it the Chapel of Our Lady of Light, and it still stands today. The sisters were thrilled with their new church, except for one small detail. There was no staircase leading up to the choir loft. Many of the lofts of churches, early churches in New Mexico, had no staircases. They simply leaned a ladder up and climbed the ladder and sang. But the sisters couldn't climb a ladder in their long uh, robes, so they, they needed a staircase. Some carpenters come in and look the situation over, but shook their heads in dismay and said there was just no way. And so they decided that they would not do anything until they made a novena to St. Joseph, the patron of carpenters. A novena is nine days of meditation and regular prayer. As it is in heaven, give For eight days, the sisters prayed. Nothing happened. But on the ninth and final day of the novena, a stranger arrived at the chapel. Come in, sir. Mother Superior, I'm seeking work. And what is your trade, sir? I'm a carpenter. We do have need of a stairway to be built in our chapel. Legend says the carpenter only had a hammer, a saw, and a T-square with him. When he was finished, he called the nuns together and said, you have your staircase. The sisters gazed with wonder at what he had built. The carpenter obviously had to be a very fine carpenter. He had to be a master carpenter because you see there's no center support. It rests by its own geometric balance and design. It's very steep, 22 feet. There's a certain springiness when you walk up it and you realize you're climbing a very, very special staircase. The sisters planned a feast for the carpenter. When he didn't show up, they searched the town. The mysterious stranger was gone. 
Nobody had seen him. Nobody knew where he slept. Nobody ever fed him. They made a novena to St. Joseph, the patron of carpenters. So it's understandable that they would believe St. Joseph did it. The chapel is now a tourist attraction. Through the years, the mystery surrounding the staircase has continued. In 1965, Oscar Hadwiger, a third generation master carpenter, visited the chapel. He went in and he saw the staircase and of course he was overwhelmed. Being a builder, any builder is overwhelmed when they see this magnificent piece of carpentry. And he remembered a story in the family that his grandfather had come to this country and, and had built a staircase. Oscar's grandfather, Johann Hadwiger, was a famous European carpenter, and he had worked in the Santa Fe area when the staircase was built. Oscar told the sisters that he thought his grandfather had built the staircase, but they were skeptical. They have nothing except their word of mouth that he did it. I don't buy it. Oscar finally found what he said was proof. In a storage room, he came across his father's toolbox. Inside was a faded sketch of a spiral staircase. The drawing was an overhead view with 33 steps. All that exists today is this photocopy. Who was the stranger who answered the sister's prayer? Was it Johann Hadwiger, the European builder? Or as the sisters of Loretto believe, was it St. Joseph himself? <laughs> 